نظرة بخير كلها الحمد لله الحمد لله الحمد لله ربي ربنا يجعلكم بخير ربنا يجعلكم بخير دايما يا فندم ربنا يخليك يا دكتور محمد حضرتك ممكن نجرب كده يا فندم؟ اه ما اعملش شيء تمام يمكن انا مش شايف بصراحه تمام يا فندم تمام حضرتك وصلت؟ ممكن نعمل فول سكرين كده يا فندم؟ اوكي تمام هي دي اول سلايد اللي هي اللي دي اول سلايد الفانل تمام دي من عندي اه تمام ربنا يخليك يا فندم وبنبارك طبعا في وجود الزملاء الحضور كلهم انا بنبارك يعني اخونا الكبير الدكتور وليد قشطه رئيس قسم العظام بجامعه ماكماستر يونيفرستي على البوزيشن الجديد تشير اوف ريسيرش كانيديان بيدياتريك اورثوبيديك سوسايتي فطبعا ده شرف كبير لنا دكتور وليد بيه ربنا يخليك يا دكتور محمد وحضرتك دايما مشرفنا في كندا كده ورافع راسنا هناك يا فندم ربنا يبارك في حضرتك يا رب ربنا يدي حضرتك الصحه يا فندم اسمح لي اقدم كده عشان نبتدي يا فندم اتفضل بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم انا طبعا يعني النهارده يوم يعني عزيز على قلبي جدا ان انا يسعدني ويشرفني ان يكون موجود معايا اخويا وحبيبي وصديقي العزيز استاذ دكتور وليد قشطه بروفيسور وليد قشطه بروفيسور اوف اورثوبيديك سيرجري اند هيد اوف اورثوبيديك سيرجري ديبارتمنت McMaster University and now working as the Chair of Research Canadian Pediatric Orthopedic Society. Dr. Walid will talk about a very important topic, principles of pediatric food surgery. Dr. Walid, we thank you for your support, because we know that the time is the time of work in Canada. We thank you for your support, and you can take your time to join us today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mohamed, and thank you for your support. اتشرف لنا ربنا يخليك يا رب. آه ودايما شرف لي طبعا ان الواحد يكون مع, مع اهله. آه النهارده هنتكلم عن pediatric foot as a as a principle we'll go through cases I think this is the best way instead of, of being just academic uh, academic lecture and we'll get the most benefit from every case. We'll start from a simple one this is a a 13-year-old patient uh, has a painful flat feet for five years. Uh, uh, if you look at the X-ray, it's not, it's not the worst flat foot. I know in, in Egypt you see worse, and uh, we see here sometimes worse. And there is a lot of dilemma about the background with the worst cases, depends on the racial background and uh, uh, even the hypermobility or the connective tissue disorder. Um, and I wrote some questions about what's what's your detailed clinical examination. Um, so we we'll just need to focus on uh, the foot examination uh, in in a flat foot case. Um, uh, people can can write. I'm not sure if I can see the the comments. Sorry, I did. Uh, uh, if if anyone wants to to write the most pertinent. A clinical examination when you get a, a flexible flat foot. I'll try to. So Dr. Muhammad can see the comments. Any حد من حضراتكم عايز يكتب his opinion في the questions answer أو في the chat. أنا شفت حاجة كتبت بس مش عارف أوصل لل. الكومنتس لا هو لسه مش طالع عندي يس ايوه كويشن انسر اكسلنت دكتور متولي ستاندنج اكزامينيشن هايند فوت الاينمنت اكسلنت سو هايند فوت الاينمنت از فيري امبورتنت اتس بيتر تو ديفايد ذا فوت انتو uh three uh, sections the hind foot is one of them uh, it can look from behind can uh, also look at the mid foot full foot from the front um it's also good to uh, to look at uh, the overall lower limb alignment we're not just the foot and ankle surgeons we're we're uh, the whole uh, body uh, surgeons um just make sure there is no uh, valgum genu valgum genu varus uh, leg length discrepancy, all these things are very important. 
and when we do examination of the foot, um, to make sure you correct the foot more neutral, don't leave it into uh, valgus. So you can do the uh, the uh, tendon Achilles examination and the proper tensioning. Um, and uh, you, you all know the silver coil test uh, that uh, differentiates uh, the uh, soleus uh, versus the gastrocnemius uh, tightness. Uh, so we do the dorsiflexion and knee flexion and knee extension and see the difference between them. Uh, is it only a tendon Achilles or uh, uh, gastroc soleus? Um, again, for, for the flat foot, although this is not the severest case, but for the flat foot, uh, if, if you look, if you look at the X-ray, you see the, the, um, the lesser toes are, have been raised on the lateral view uh, compared to the, uh, first ray. And, um, and also, uh, usually with the flat foot associated with hind foot valgus, uh, more than, uh, uh, the, compared to the cavus foot that has hind foot verse. Uh, but it's very interesting as a principle of the foot deformity um, and baton score, thanks Dr. Mitwali. Uh, very important for uh, pediatric or foot deformities in general, uh, that usually uh, I would classify the foot problems uh, deformity into um, short side, long side, and rotation. So always look at which side is short, which side is long, uh, plus the rotation. Don't forget the rotation. And um, it's very interesting that the rotation is usually opposite, uh, and the forefoot rotation is opposite to the hind foot rotation. And um, and Dr. Mosca has a famous twisted towel technique. He gets a towel and twist it. So it's a hind foot if, if it's in valgus, Usually the full foot is uh, supinated, um, and that applies to the flat foot. So in the flat foot, um, the full foot is usually supinated, and we get most of the referral from family physicians saying pronated foot, pronated foot, which is uh, usually is the opposite. But as orthopedic surgeons, we know that the full foot is supinated uh, relative to the hind foot, and uh, although the whole foot looks pronated, but uh, why is this is important to know that the uh, forefoot is uh, has the opposite direction? Uh, it's important because once you correct the deformity of the hind foot, uh, of the of flattening or with whatever technique, you will get exaggeration of the rotation deformity of the forefoot. So then you have to deal with it. So it's it's good to expect what will be uh, the rotation deformity of the forefoot because it will get exaggerated. Uh, so with this patient, we, uh, we tried all the non-operative methods. Uh, as you know, there is no strong evidence about orthotics uh, with, uh, with a flat foot, but um, we always try, uh, especially if it's painful. Uh, also, if not, uh, with a flexible flat foot that's painless, don't operate on it. Uh, there is a huge study done in uh, 1945 by the Canadian Army uh, about the stress fracture in soldiers uh, who had flexible flat foot. They found that uh, they have less risk of stress fracture compared to the normal feet soldiers. So it's, a, it's not something bad for military. I know it's a, it's a big thing for the decision-making in, uh, in our, our lands, but... Um, uh, it's we. I feel like we exaggerate uh, a lot about the flexible flat foot, especially if it's painless. Um, lots of debate about bracing early on. Uh, also, of note that uh, there is a study done, and all the kids up to the age of ten years, uh, they do footprint. They found all of them has flat foot. Uh, this is normal. They have a fat pad at the at the arch. So flat foot. Uh, up to the age of 10 is normal. So no surgeries for flexible flat foot, uh, as long as there is no uh, congenital vertical talus, there is no rigidity, there is no other issues. Idiopathic flexible flat foot up to the age of 10 is normal. I know parents are very nervous about it, and uh, we, we don't have to be nervous and share this um, 
anxiety with them and take them to surgery, especially with the new techniques of um, arthroreses and stuff. Uh, it's it's again surgery, put them under anesthesia. Uh, if they're asymptomatic, don't do surgery. The debate is about orthotics versus no orthotics, and I, I don't recommend orthotics under the age of 10. And uh, as Dr. Mosca mentioned before, it's a life sentence. Um, so they're used to it. They get weakened, weak muscles, they get weak plantar fascia, weak plantar muscles, and they will use to it. They will spend all their life uh, in orthotics. Uh, so this is something we need to consider um, unless some kids who has severe hypermobility and or connective tissue disorders and they're not able to function without orthotics. That's a different category than the idiopathic uh, uh, flat foot. So this patient, physiotherapy, uh, has failed to uh, manage his pain and, um, and they're asking for surgery. And I will open the questions now. What would be the options of surgical management? Uh, in this case, it's a very mild, uh, but painful. Our dear attendees, your opinion about the management of uh, such a case. All right, this is one of the most common cases you will see in your practice. And um, and so far, the standard uh, for such cases is calcaneal neck lengthening. And in adults, you like to call it events. And pediatric wards, you like to call it MOSCA. And, um, and again, um, uh, I know some, uh, I work with some Europeans uh, before they used to call this calcaneal hypoplasia, when they see calcaneus shorter than the Taylor uh, doom. Um, the theory of uh, lateral column lengthening and medial column shortening uh, to create the arch is, um, uh, yeah, thanks, Dr. Dr. Matwali. Dr. Matwali. Uh, um, so uh, the, the idea of lateral column uh, shortening, uh, medial column uh, lengthening uh, is good for uh, teaching uh, purposes, uh, but we uh, kind of did a study um, that uh, when we did uh, lateral column lengthening and we measured the index, the relationship of the lateral column to medial column, we found no change, no significant difference. The significant difference that we found was uh, the telonavicular coverage that was significant. Um, Professor Walid, Dr. Hagar is, is writing Achilles tendon or gastrocnemia fascia lengthening. Yeah, is this um, is this a question, Dr. Hagar? Like you, you you're asking me, I would prefer Achilles tendon or gastro fascia lengthening. I, I think it's her answer. Yeah. It's an answer. Okay. Um, yeah, so we uh, sometimes we do Achilles tendon uh, lengthening. I would suggest not to do the proper Achilles tendon lengthening, but it's all uh, about the silver scoil test. Uh, mostly I do uh, gastrocnemius uh, fascia um, uh, lengthening with, uh, with whatever the technique you would like to do. So you just do the gastroc fascia. Uh, I avoid the tendo, tendo Achilles lengthening. Um, because um, uh, of uh, I want to avoid the over lengthening. So then you get the calcaneus deformity, and uh, especially in neuromuscular cases or connective tissues orders, you can get a crouch gait after. Um, the hind foot alignment view, I don't have it here, Dr. Mitwelli, uh, but uh, clinically he was um, uh, it was neutral. Uh, but it's it's a very good uh, point. Um, and uh, uh, now we have the protocol of having salesman uh, hind foot uh, um, alignment view, uh, which is uh, uh, very important to assess uh, the hind foot alignment and the relationship of calcaneus to the ankle. And that's another good point and added to the principles. We need to uh, differentiate between uh, the hind foot valgus that comes from the septal joint 
and the hind foot valgus that comes from the ankle joint because the treatment will be different. So my my favorite technique is calcaneal neck lengthening, and uh, it's uh, it's uh, we do it at uh, at the distal third of the calcaneus, um, and I like to put the trapezoidal uh, one point five uh, centimeter of uh, bone graft uh, after the cut. Before you do your cut, make sure you uh, stabilize the calcaneal cuboid joint with a K wire. Uh, otherwise, with lengthening causes some tensioning and causes some uh, subluxation. And um, to avoid this, just prophylactic, uh, put a K-wire there and um, before you do your cut and do your lengthening. Uh, I like the allograft. Uh, some people do use the autograft, uh, but just trying to avoid um, uh, uh, another adding comorbidity. Um, I like to, uh, after do the, the lengthening, to do uh, tibialis posterior tendon shortening and uh, capsular shortening, assess as a forefoot supination, as we mentioned. And uh, if there is forefoot supination, uh, I like to add a cotton procedure, which is dorsiflexion, uh, open wedge osteotomy of the medial kinoform, uh, so can bring the, the first strain more down. At the end, I assess the Achilles tendon, uh, again, silver coil test, and mostly I would do, if needed, uh, a gastro session, uh, and I avoid tendo Achilles lengthening, if that's uh, um, the, the answer to Dr. Hager. So here is a, a bone graft after healing, uh, looking at the tenal navicular coverage. Um, uh, I think, I can't remember, I did uh, medial kiniform cotton procedure for him, but it seems like he has healed um, uh, some uh, some irregularity there. Uh, calcanus has been lengthened. Uh, again, we did a study that uh, was presented at the American Academy and the uh, CCOT that was done uh, in Montreal a few years ago, uh, measuring the lateral uh, column lengthening versus the medial column shortening. And we came out with the idea of the foot index uh, but we found that uh, there was no significant difference. The significant difference was the telonavicular coverage was significant with calcin and neck lengthening, uh, although our study was on, uh, on cerebral palsy cases. Uh, to uh, of note, in, um, when you do calcin and neck lengthening in cerebral palsy, plano valgus feet, the uh, recurrence rate is about 25%. Uh, some people recommend now doing telonavicular fusion and CP when you do the calcaneal lengthening uh, with or without. Um, I still don't like to do fusion in younger kids unless it's a, it's a revision or uh, they're older or there is some sort of arthritis, but um, it's one of the options to decrease the risk of recurrence. Any questions about this case? Professor Walid, uh, um, is, there is a, a great difference between the principles of uh, pediatric and adult uh, principles in uh, flexible flat foot? Uh, yes, it's a, the difference would be uh, number one for the pathology and number two for uh, the management. Most of the adults are, um, are due to tibialis posterior insufficiency. That, that's mostly the presentation. And it's very uh, devastating pathology and it's very progressing. Um, and it depends on the stage um, the deal with it. So early, uh, they either do debridement for stage one, stage two, they can do, uh, they call it events in adults and pediatric call it MOSCA. And um, uh, FDL transfer uh, is one of the things that commonly done in adults more than in children and um, uh, in adults also easily to uh, consider fusion uh, more than in children, which we, we try our best to avoid the fusion That's in children right, yeah. and maintain the flexibility. Uh, but again, some adults still get the flexible flat foot from their childhood. And uh, it's it's very common and familiar, um, but 
my message with the flexible flat foot, if it's asymptomatic, we shouldn't exaggerate it. It's, we shouldn't treat it as a cosmetic problem. Uh, we should deal with it as a functional problem. Um, has he had the MRI? So I'll move to the next case. I uh, I see no questions, and and I know you you probably do more of of flat feet more than I do. Um. So uh, I'll move to the other thing, which is another common topic. Uh, uh clubfoot and DDH uh, are fifty percent of the pediatric orthopedic practice. So when we get there, for fifty percent are club feet and DDH. So uh, we finally. Uh, we have a clubfoot clinic now. It's running for over seven years at McMaster, and um, uh, it's been a very dedicated clinic. Uh, so this patient is a three-month-old uh, boy with uh, um, uh, foot deformity. Uh, diagnosis a clubfoot, uh, as I mentioned, and we need someone to describe the deformity. It's a very famous question in each exam. We can go over that and then discuss it because I'm able to review it and say, because sometimes ligaments need surgery. Sometimes they don't, right? And they can just keep popping up, right? Because you all could possibly, again, I'm not a doctor. So always when you have questions, you just. So the, the easy way to describe it, right. and, and you can, here we go, yeah. get an answer. Cave, okay. excellent. So, Dr. Ali. Uh, so it's a cave deformity. C is a uh, cavus and A is adduction. V is a uh, varus and uh, uh, E is Aquinas. Dr. Gaith um, raised his hand. Uh, do you have a question? Dr. Gaith has, uh, he, he raised his hand, but I don't know how, uh, probably write the question better, easier, Dr. Gaith. Uh, it's a cave, uh, severe form, Dr. Abdullah. That's that's correct. So we agree, it's a cave, so cavus, adduction, um, verse, and equinus. And, um, and how is this helpful towards the treatment protocol? Uh, so... Can anyone describe the treatment protocol? So what do you guys do? Ponseti. And um, and what would be your steps for uh, Ponseti casting? So Ponseti is uh, serial casting. Uh, usually average of six weeks, followed by um, uh, Achilles tenotomy. I'll just uh, uh, try to uh, go through the case. So go with the cave order. Excellent. Um, so um, uh, Dr. Ali means uh, we'll go with the cave order. So when you do the first cast, uh, you put your thumb under the first metatarsal head so you can stretch uh, the plantar aspect of the foot so you can get uh, the cavus correction. And uh, at the same time, you correct the uh, uh, adduction uh, to abduction and the verse. And uh, there is a special trick uh, between Bunseti and the other methods. The famous one is uh, old kite method. Uh, so where you put your thumb, um, so the site of the fulcrum, Dr. Nutwelli, and will be the site of the fulcrum. At the head of the talus. Perfect. So we'll do this gentle uh, serial uh, correction every week, bring the patient uh, uh, weekly and uh, different techniques of casting materials. Some people prefer the, the plaster. I used to do a lot of plaster because I, I feel like it molds very well. Now I use the soft fiberglass. Um, advantage of soft fiberglass is parents can take it off at home before coming. Uh, we can also um, uh, they can we we taught them before to take the plaster off. 
Yes, that's correct, Dr. Mitwali. Dr. Mitwali said uh, in Ponseti, uh, it's the head of the talus, but uh, chiti is the neck of the calcaneus and causes more uh, more destruction of the cartilage. And uh, also, um, uh, people found more of flat uh, top talus after kite method. Um, so uh, the, the message from Ponseti is you go anatomic, um, and uh, and try to restore the anatomy. Teronovicular joint is dislocated, so we need to reduce it. It's not a traumatic case, but it's developmental congenital or, or whatever you, you name it. Uh, so then we have to do gradual correction. When you do stretching every time, and you have to be gentle, you don't have to, uh, to be very aggressive to get the correction uh, very quickly. Uh, but you have to be gentle with the soft tissues because you're stretching soft tissues, muscles, ligaments, and uh, nerves and vessels. Uh, so when you do the stretching, do um, uh, what, what you feel it's uh, safe uh, every time and uh, take your time uh, with it, that's fine. And, uh, and then you apply the cast uh, with good padding. One of the problems with, uh, with the padding is the slippage of the cast. We use a tincture on the skin. Uh, that maintains uh, the webral on a skin and avoid uh, slippage. Some people come from very far. Uh, when I did this fellowship, uh, we had a patient used to come seven hour drive every week, seven hour drive back and forth, it's 14 hours to, to, to get the Ponseti cast. And um, you don't want this to, um, to slip. Then you apply the cast, you go above the knee, you have to flex the knee 90 degrees. Uh, flexion of the knee. I remember Dr. Magdi Sayed, Dr. Muhammad, yes. uh, when I was resident, uh, he asked me, why, why you go above the knee? He has mentioned three benefits. I still remember him. Uh, so he had three, three benefits. Number one, maintain the cast because you make a hinge for the 90 degrees. Number two, it relaxes the gastrox, so it's good for the correction. And it's actually, it's a very good notice. And some parents uh, notice this. You know, all kids born with uh, genovarum. And uh, and then club feet, especially with bilateral, they get corrected. Because with the cast, we go into external rotation. The genovarum get corrected. Although it's physiologic, we don't have to. But it's just um, uh, a secondary benefit. Um, so yeah, just uh, every time I remember Dr. Magdis said, been a yidiru uh, Don't do any dorsiflexion when you do casting, uh, because what what you will do before correction is uh, if you do dorsiflexion, you will crush the, the talus and you might crush the navicular, you might crush whatever is still cartilaginous there. Everything is soft. Restore the anatomy. This is the idea of Ponseti. He did anatomical studies on uh, on the bone of uh, stillbirth and and, and kids with the club feet, and he studied this significantly and intensively until he reached this this technique. Um, so it is, I would say, if if I choose, uh, the best thing was done in the last uh, hundred years, it will be the Ponseti treatment that saved a significant uh, amount of people. Uh, from having uh, a disability. Now, these kids are almost normal. Uh, they play soccer, they play football, or and um, and they run. They're fine. They're normal. You you wouldn't uh, expect that they had a club foot before uh, because of Ponseti. It uh, it ends in uh, flexible plantar grade foot, and it's a, it's painless compared to the other surgical options. I I still see the question from Doctor Ali when yeah. We can use post remedial release, which is excellent question. Uh, but we'll yeah. I will keep going talking about the Bone City as a as a principle. So um, keep doing casting. I know there is a speedy uh, technique. You do it twice a week. It all depends on your practice. If you're in private practice, it's easy. In our practice here, we uh, we it's not easy to find a clinical space. So my club for clinic is every week. Uh, that's fine. That's enough. Right, Even if they're cast slip, I tell them okay. if the patient cry, take it off. Just take it off. Come back next week. That's fine. We'll start over. Um, that's more safe and it matches my practice. If anything else matches your practice, 
uh, that's okay. That's fine if you want to do it twice a week to do a speedy uh, fasting. It's been uh, approved with evidence now. Um, but again, go gentle. And uh, I tend not to do pressure with the thumb after I put the cast on to avoid uh, uh, skin sore. I know some people still do it. Uh, I don't recommend it because it causes a significant ulcer on the skin. Um, after we finish uh, foot correction, lots of uh, debate about how much external rotation you want to have in the subtalar joint. Yeah. Uh, some people want to no. get 45 degrees, 60 degrees. Uh, I would yeah. tell you, um, and this might be uh, a surprise. Yeah. Once I reach teronavicular coverage, I add one more cast. So I, I don't, I don't look at these numbers. And so far, I have very good outcomes. I would tell you uh, the most um, uh, important thing in my practice is to start early, as early as possible. It makes a huge difference. I start at one week, two weeks old and use one inch cast, it's it's fantastic. Uh, they're very flexible, they respond very nicely. And then uh, when we do the Achilles tenotomy, do you make Achilles stenotomy for all patients? Yes, 99%. Uh, uh, if the patient doesn't need Achilles stenotomy, uh, they're either uh, uh, flexible flat for a club foot or um, they're flexible and they get corrected. Um, but again, don't, don't hope for not doing Achilles tenotomy. Uh, and don't push for casting and uh, dorsiflexion during casting because you probably would injure the cartilage and affect the growth later on and ending in flat top talus. Very difficult to treat later on. So I think about their future. Just be gentle with them. And um, have a low threshold to do Achilles tenotomy. Low threshold. If you get hesitant do it um, because these are the cases will come back later and you have to do it and it will be older stiffer and it's uh, it's very difficult to treat and they get very stronger they kick you when you do the cast so it's a uh, it's better to avoid that uh, i still uh, after tenotomy i use uh, two types of freezing so i use the emla gel uh, keep it for 20 minutes and then i do injection with um, uh, xylocaine uh, one percent uh, beside the Achilles tendon. One of the disadvantages of xylocaine when you inject it, um, you feel the Achilles tendon, then you lose the feeling. It causes some fullness, but uh, sometimes I mark it before I inject. And then when I come back, I know where is the Achilles tendon. I use a kind of blade, uh, the the knife. It's called beaver blade. It's a very tiny knife, and um, it's beavered from one side. Um, what I do as I don't have a picture, but imagine this Achilles tendon. I go from the medial side because it's a dangerous side. It's better to go from the dangerous to the safe. And I go parallel to the tendon. Um, after I feel it, then I turn the knife to 90 degrees. Everything gentle. And once you turn the knife, do dorsiflexion, you will feel the pop right away. It's it's very good. And uh, you go um, uh, peritoneus. So this way, the regrowth, it looks similar to the normal tendon. And the scar is tiny. Um, after we reach the dorsiflexion, we always hope to get at least 10 degrees dorsiflexion. But to be honest, not all the patients get 10 degrees. Some of them stops at neutral. Um, we used to get uh, anxious when we see this. Oh, what can we do now? Uh, should we do serial casting again? They scream, they cry. You just did surgery for them, even if it's in the clinic. So don't worry. Uh, put them in a cast and uh, three weeks, put them in boots and bars. They get corrected in the boots and bars uh, afterwards. I know you will hear a lot of things about doing uh, any anything different than boots and bars. No strong evidence so far. The best evidence so far is still the boots and bars. Get a new, uh, uh, a good quality boots and bar. Um, it's common to do more than one time to not me. Yeah, it's a good question. So uh, uh, I use, uh, uh, I don't have to mention the, the company's name, but uh, uh, Ponseti or Mitchell usually have a good material, less uh, blisters and uh, less pain. Uh, we know that all Dennis Brown one, um, I stopped using it. 
but um, uh, still some people use it. Um, boots and bars, be very strict with Ponsetti method. It's a, the best method that has a plan. Uh, three months, 23 hours, and uh, and they're still young, they're not walking. And then after that, I move to uh, nighttime. Uh, I like the 14 hours, uh, so usually 12 hours at night. Uh, most of the kids sleep for a long time, and then two hours nap time. Um, and this has to continue uh, minimum until, until the age of four years. Uh, I make a plan with the family before we start. If they're hesitant, uh, I would tell them you can see someone else, uh, but I wouldn't look for failure. I wouldn't look for recurrence um, because you don't want this. And when they get older, it's more complex and I'm getting more older. Uh, so I, I don't want to deal with difficult cast at this age and get some back pain and stuff. Um, so what the question, uh, would you do more uh, than tenotomy, more than, so for the idiopathic, uh, club foot. It's very rare, uh, Doctor Hajer. Uh, you need to do it uh, in in multiple times. In 2010, we published a study. Uh, we found 10% of the club feet had accessory soleus tendon. Uh, when I was in Kuwait, and uh, we published in uh, in Belgium, uh, Acta Orthopedica, uh, Belgium, and um, and we found that in some cases we do the Achilles tendon tenotomy and then still there's a huge tendon behind it. Uh, we started for investigation to look at this tendon, found a similar size one, and then um, uh, with the investigation and research, uh, you can find the study online. We found that 10%, uh, so uh, 20 feet out of 200 feet had accessory soleus tendon has been reported before. And... Um, and it has to be released at the same time. Uh, although it's very rare, but it's good to be aware about. If you get uh, Aquinas recurrence very quickly and uh, very soon, uh, examine the back of the patient. And that's good, important for the PhD exam as a doc doctorate. So always examine the back. So uh, I did doctorate for Aslaini. Uh, I will hire you for, did you examine the back? If you didn't examine the back, I'll ask, come in six months. Um, uh, so it's, uh, it's very important too. And, uh, if you notice during the course, even, uh, with a patient that, uh, they get weird things. If, if your practice is very common with a club foot, they, they get very quick recurrence. They walk, uh, awkwardly, um, even when they get older, the recurrence, uh, looks very, uh, strange to your practice and your experience, uh, do MRI spine, uh, get the spine MRI, see what's going on, um, and you wouldn't lose anything. Sometimes it's a tether cord, sometimes it's something that neurosurgery can treat and makes the rest of the life easy. Uh, one of the things uh, very hard to discover initially is the syndromic clubfoot. So if it's very, very difficult to uh, discover uh, except with your experience, you will feel like, man, this toes looks different than I usually see. They look flattened, shortened. Uh, there is a dimple. There are some stuff, but it's uh, it will be good if we have a very good uh, evidence about how to early diagnose the syndromic uh, club feet. But uh, I'm very sure all of you, when you get the baby, you look at their face, make sure it's not syndromic. You look at their uh, spine, you look at their hips, making sure there is no other clues that this kid is uh, syndromic because syndromic uh, takes longer casting, they're more rigid, they have higher risk of recurrence and um, and it's good to expect early and tell the parents this. One of the common things I usually see also is uh, nail abnormality of the big toe and I don't know why this happens with from uh, correction, casting, boots and bars, uh, everything. When you change, you get some deformities, usually asymptomatic. Usually there's no ingrown nail, nail infection. Um, and um, uh, and that's it's another good thing to, to study. Uh, Dr. Marif, uh, do you have uh, cases of overcorrection with Ponsetti method? Um, as I mentioned, uh, 
when I get telonavicular coverage, I go with one more cast, and I don't do I don't go to forty five and sixty degrees. Although I I adjust the boots and bar to sixty degrees uh, outward early on when I was uh, in my early career. I met Doctor Mosca, uh, and I asked him. He said, man, you, you cannot get 60 degrees from the subtalar joint and the ankle joint, but it's a spread from some from the subtalar, some from the ankle, some from the knee, actually, some from that. So all this external tissue is distributed uh, all over the lower limb. Uh, just not don't be aggressive. But that's a good question. I sometimes see overcorrection with Bonsetti method. Sometimes I go case by case. Uh, I don't want to popularize this, but I would tell the family, you know what? Let's adjust the boots and bar to 45 degrees. Let's adjust it to 40 degrees. I see overcorrection. I see a crease lateral. And uh, commonly these kids has kind of hypermobility or connective tissues order most of the time is undiagnosed. Sometimes when we start, uh, when they start walking, they come with uh, uh, flat foot. Um, this is common when they have the boots and bar. Uh, it disappears after we stop after the age of four. The only thing I would warn you to do, which is very harmful, is to break the midfoot. So don't do um, overcorrection by yourself to get the midfoot break. Do you do serial casting of rigid one with uh, like arthrogribosis? Yes, and do them early. And uh, they take longer uh, casting weeks, but keep doing it. Uh, uh, they do way better than oh, sure. if you don't do it. So when you see arthrogribosis, don't get scared. Start right away. Uh, they have higher risk of recurrence, they have higher risk of need for surgery, but at the end, it's way better than leaving them alone and getting them more rigid, and it's very, very impossible to deal with them later on. It's okay to do some modification, as Dr. Uh, Stahili mentioned before, is you can do serial casting, and then you do tenotomy, and then they get recurrence back, do serial casting again. It's fine to be flexible with them. Try your best to get the correction as early as possible with the uh, uh, arthro bosis so it will uh, be appreciated. Yes. Professor Walid, how many times do you do serial casting? In in the the uh, or, uh, telepass cases, the, the normal telepass case or the ordinary telepass case, and in arthrogripotic cases? As we know, oh. I think you, you don't have to exceed uh, 10 times serial casting. Am I right? Um, I, I don't think there is evidence of like the timing uh, not to exceed, uh, but yeah. arthrogrobosis average is 12, so which yeah. is fine. If they need more, that's fine. I do more. Uh, spina bifida, sometimes they behave like arthrogrobosis and they're rigid, and I, I keep going until I get uh, the maximum I can get. Uh, sometimes you're not able to get the telonavicular co uh, coverage completely, and uh, I try twice after to see sometimes you get suddenly um, relaxed and with a creep um, mechanism as uh, you get more stretch. Um, but if two more and there is no progression, then I go for the Achilles tendon. And sometimes once you do Achilles tenotomy, you feel things are more loose, uh, then give them the three weeks. Uh, if they're reasonable, I bought them in a boots and bar. If they're not reasonable, still rigid, then I do serial casting again. So I, I don't see any evidence of uh, limiting the numbers of serial casting. And uh, although serial casting is a good option, uh, even in older kids, um, it's, it's still a good idea, as long as it's done right. Um, like not pushing to dorsiflexion before the correction of the telonavicular. This is very important, otherwise we'll get a midfoot break. <clears throat> yes. Sir, and do you prefer to use serial follow-up x-rays during casting? No, I never. Um, okay. So very, very rare to do x-rays. Yeah. Uh, go all clinical. Yes. Right. It's good also to to avoid radiation in, in these kids. Um, the average for idiopathic is four to six casts. Did I miss any questions? There was a question early about uh, when you do posterior media disease. Uh, I have high... Uh, threshold to reach to this. I always try casting. I always try the minimum. Uh, Posture media release is my last resort. And uh, the reason is once you open them, posture media, you have, I would say, you have one chance. Uh, they will get stiff, they get scar. Uh, then revision is very, very 
challenging, you don't like it, they get pain, they get stiffness. So keep it the last option. Serial casting is always fantastic. Do the minimum, do tenotomies, reduce your incisions, decrease the scar, and um, probably we will talk about this in the next case. And what about Cincinnati? So do you use Cincinnati? I, I've been raised on the Cincinnati incision, and now it became very, very rare. Success yeah. rate of Ponsetti is 95%. Um, he mentioned 45% uh, of cases need tip and transfer. So it's another minor procedure. And um, we can talk about this. We uh, we are doing, uh, uh, we did a study published last year about the recurrence of clubfoot uh, with all the techniques that can be done. Um, it's it's online available. Uh, I would encourage everyone to read it. It's, it's, it's a well-written study and it's fulfilling all the, the algorithm of what what we should do but i'm a big fan with recurrence especially early on before the age of five to go back to serial casting try again that's fine even after age of five uh, but um, um, postromedial cincinnati don't do them uh, early we still still have very very good capacity with casting uh, some people do casting up to the age of 12. Some people do up to the age of 16. Uh, but again, it depends on how rigid is the club foot, how uh, uh, significant is the deformity and how complex it is. Uh, but when you see it flexible, uh, take this advantage and do serial casting same way as Ponsetti. Even if you want to do a frame, uh, as Dr. Herzenberg in Baltimore, uh, he's doing the a Ponsetti technique with a frame. He's able to it's so, uh, olive wire at the tailor uh, neck uh, when he rotates the frame around it. So it's the same same concept. Um, so as this lecture is uh, about um, basic principles of uh, pediatric foot, always go with the anatomy. Try to be anatomic and reconstructive more than doing salvage. Uh, The most common thing mentioned by uh, Dr. Ponsetti, 45% needs tip and transfer. Um, right now, we have a good team working on timing of tip and transfer. Uh, there is a big variation. Uh, Baltimore did it as early as the age of two and a half. I don't like this. Um, so we developed a protocol. Um, most of the patients we found that they're not compliant with the boots and bars. Uh, so we uh, try to address why is, what's the problem and then uh, try our best to go back to boots and bar. I add AFOs. Uh, we do physiotherapy protocol aiming and strengthening the perineal muscles. Uh, so far, we have very good outcomes. Still, there's some patients that don't respond and they need a tip and transfer. Uh, I don't believe doing tip and transfer early. Uh, I know in Egypt, we used to get the uh, Bardofil Doctora they talk about the ossification. I have to um, wait for the ossification of the um, medial kiniform, medial kiniform, or the, and the navicular, which is minimum of three years, uh, which sounds to be matching with the evidence because it doesn't make sense to transfer a tendon to cartilage. Like I, I can't imagine tenodesis, uh, tendon to cartilage. Tendon to bone is good, it's okay. And it's been uh, working for years, but tendon to cartilage, Although they say it works, lots of techniques and uh, uh, respect the pediatric foot. Like if you want to do tendon transfer, do try it. Uh, not to get the tendon just suture to preosteum. Say, oh, this is still young. They will get it. And then the tendon get loose and then you lose a chance. They have only one tip end in a foot. So uh, don't lose it. Uh, so do it in the right time. But always try non-operative first and you'll be surprised. Um but this is a case that has uh, supination. There is a lot of debate how to define the dynamic supination, when to treat it, and uh, two incisions versus three incisions. I would also uh, recommend reading the study GPO published last year. It was a Delphi study uh, from uh, 17 uh, pediatric foot and ankle surgeons in, uh, all over the world. And um, I'm, uh, I'm uh, uh, very... Uh, uh, happy to be one of them, and we did uh, publish this study about the role of dynamic supination and definition, all the basic science about it. 
uh, was published GBO last year, and um, I think you can find it easily. If if you can't, email me. I will send it to you. Uh, just go to. This is one of the kids. Uh, always he uh, he's not happy, uh, especially when he see me. I get his uh, his his sad face, uh, and I was concerned about him. He's doing very well, and uh, he lost a follow up. And finally, he came after six years with a smile, uh, which, which is very good. He still remember me. And uh, he came with dynamic supination. Uh, right now, we're doing um, we're doing the non-operative method techniques. Doing, uh, so far, he's doing very well. I tried the non-operative uh, technique for one year so far, and we'll see if it doesn't work. Then we'll do the tip and transfer. Any questions before we go to case number three? And feel free to uh, tell me to stop. And uh, if you want to go to sleep, I know it's, uh, it's more late. It's almost 10 o'clock in, in, in Egypt and uh, Middle East. And for us, um, we're still, uh, still before 3 p.m. احنا احنا بنبدا الشغل بعد 10 اه عارف اه any question did i miss anything in uh, club foot it's uh, we we can have one uh, like night for club foot and uh, it's it's hard to stop talking about the club foot but let me know dr gaith um uh, gaith uh, still hands up. I'm not sure if it's, uh, it's like from the beginning or it's a new thing, but uh, feel free uh, to drop your uh, question. Professor Walid, when do you decide to use external fixation? Yes, uh, that's, that's very good. Uh, probably we'll talk uh, about it in case three. Um, yes. So this would be an uh, excellent one to talk about it. Was a hand rise. Um, probably we'll move to case three now, and uh, and it's still a club foot. So it's um, uh, if if you still have a question from the previous case, uh, feel free to uh, to drop it on the on the chat uh, screen. Um, so um, this patient is five year old girl. When I uh, when I moved to McMaster. I get a bunch of these cases and had surgeries done before posterior media release, uh, Cincinnati's get recurrence and uh, and it was not fair uh, to give it to the the new guy. <laughs> Here we go, take these recurrent arthrograbosis cases and show us what you can do. But um, yeah, these cases are different. Uh, we mentioned I still do Ponseti for them at least correct the club foot. I found with them, they get more uh, recurrence with the hind foot. Like at least you correct uh, the cavus, correct uh, the uh, adduction. Um, usually they come with recurrence of equinus mostly and uh, and sometimes equinus and heel bur uh, burst. Uh, so this patient had surgery before posterior media release. Uh, they still can get uh, recurrence and, um, and she came with very severe equinus and verse and uh, she had surgery before Achilles tendon lengthening and uh, and was very rigid and this these are the three views uh, with the pictures and uh, let me know what what would be your management plan at this stage or what will be your suggestions? Yeah, I think I know where it is. So when I get home, remind me. Dr. Ali. That's one option. Okay. All right. So Dr. Ali mentioned Elizarov as a patient had surgery before, which is uh, accepted uh, option. 
uh, although uh, some some of the senior pediatric foot surgeons uh, don't like to do it uh, early on. Dr. Abdullah mentioned telectomy, excellent, another option. Um, so uh, yeah, let's let's uh, discuss the laser uh, Some people uh, say um, it's better not to do it before the age of uh, of eight. No evidence about it. It's just experience and uh, the experts. Um, so around this age of five, before the age of eight, uh, assess the patient. Uh, I do serial casting again to see how it goes and uh, how it responds. You'll be surprised most of the time, and then even after surgery, and I try to go inside. Um, French likes the name a la carte. As you go a la carte, we use it uh, in Egypt as well. Do the same thing. Cincinnati is a problem because uh, they get severe equinus. Then you, when you get dorsiflexion, you are not able to close this, this, the incision. Uh, some people say keep it and do serial casting after two weeks or change the cast in the OR, which is fine. Uh, always, always consider the serial casting. Always your friend. And um, and then I wouldn't do Elizarov at this age un unless the patient pass uh, age of eight. And and but I don't have a strong evidence because of uh, uh, no strong evidence about it. It's just experience. You get more recurrence uh, if you do them younger. Um, and te telectomy is um, a very good uh, choice, uh, especially for non-ambulatory. Uh, I had a discussion recently with Dr. Riji Hamdi, who's an uh, Egyptian in uh, Shriners, Montreal. Uh, he has uh, immense experience. Uh, he said even for ambulatory, telectomy uh, uh, works. It's fine. They still even can walk. So it's one option. Uh, some people recommend navicolectomy. They say, okay, the problem is the space. So it's going to take the small bone and leave the talus under the calcaneus and under the tibia and make a good ankle joint. Uh, but again, if we go to the principles, um, so what I do, soft tissue release, uh, shorten the long, lengthen the short, and deal with the rotation. So do some uh, serial casting, do calcaneal uh, uh, cal uh, cuboid, uh, closing wedge osteotomy, take the graft, uh, do medial cuneiform osteotomy, put the graft in, so you shorten the lateral border, you lengthen the medial border, and uh, you deal with the rotation. Make sure uh, you do talonavicular reduction. It's unfortunate sometimes you go inside, it, you see the talus head deformed, it became flattened and widened, and you're not able to get the, the navicular reduced, but do your best to get the alignment, this is uh, reconstruction. If you want to do Lazarov, it's fine, but do it as a reconstruction, not as a salvage. Uh, there is a theory in the pediatric foot about the acetabulum pedis. Uh, so you can imagine the talus head as a femur head. So comparing the, the, the subtalar joint to the hip joint. And uh, the talar head is the femur head, except femur head is mobile why the talus is uh, one that's supposed to be fixed. And it gets the covers by the navicular, which is uh, simulating the acetabulum in, in the hip. Uh, the difference is the head is fixed and the rest is moving around it. This is what you try to do, either uh, with serial casting, either with open. If things work with you, you're doing a good reconstruction. Uh, compared to doing osteotomies around it, leaving the telonavicular dis displaced and dislocated, that's kind of salvage, uh, which can be at the end if we fail to do reconstruction, but whenever you get a chance to recon, do recon. Uh, with surgery, with Lazarov. Now the dilemma is uh, how to deal with residual uh, equinus, because you do posterior release, and uh, and it's still in the case in equinus. Um, lots of options. Uh, one of the options is to do guided growth anterior distal tibia, and slowly they can get up. Uh, remember, this is a very, very slow uh, physis, um, so it's going to take forever. Uh, the other option is to do uh, dorsal flexion closing wedge osteotomy of the distal tibia. Uh, 
postural media relapse, calcaneo cuboid osteotomy, navicolectomy, sometime anterior tibial osteotomy. Perfect. I like this plan, Dr. Marv. And uh, again, I would recommend reading the study, uh, uh, recurrent clubfoot uh, scoping review um, done by uh, our team and was published uh, last year. It has all the algorithms uh, for the timing and what procedures we uh, we recommend based on um, on the timing of recurrence and the rigidity. Uh, Lazarov is one of them, or TSF or whatever uh, circular frame, and tibial osteotomy, guided growth, uh, telectomy, navicolectomy, all these kind or osteotomies. Uh, it depends on the severity and it depends on the timing. Sir, so, still you do decancellation of the cuboid or, or you don't uh, do it? Uh, I I try to do wedge, uh, so closing wedge, so I can use it as a bone graft medially, not to waste the bone. But uh, in severe cases, syndromic, uh, no way except the decancellation, and it's quick. Uh, I work, I, I've seen one doing also decancellation of the talus. Uh, so through a small incision, decancellation and getting the correction. But again, uh, decancellation of the talus is, uh, is salvage. Uh, uh, most important to get the telonavicular reduced first and then do whatever uh, around it to correct. Can you use arthrodesis? Uh, not, not very early, Dr. Ali. Uh, so maybe... In severe cases, uh, after the age of 12, I try to delay it more. Uh, but uh, if you do RCDs in the age of five and they stop growing, they get a very small foot, especially in unilateral. Uh, it's not um, not functional as well, not, not only a cosmetic problem. Um, it's okay to move to next case. Um, so yeah, let's go to trauma. Everyone likes the trauma. 14-year-old uh, female uh, has motor vehicle accident, uh, severe midfoot swelling and pain. Uh, what would be the diagnosis? Uh, X-rays are not uh, not the full views, but you know, usually in the trauma, this is what you get from the MRI. There you go. Quick answer. Always the trauma get a quick answer. That's Frank, excellent. So there is, um, I'm sure the CT better. So the CT and here's the 3D as well. Uh, she had a middle kiniform uh, um, comminuted fracture, which is intraarticular causing uh, less frank injury. So it's a, it's a bony less frank and uh, medial colon uh, collapse. Uh, she's 14, is there, uh, I know you, you, you will go and, and fix this. Is there anything? Uh, special to consider at this age for the young age. I know in adults, it's okay to uh, uh, to fix, but uh, anything different in this age? Or what will be your your method of fixation? It's uh, it's fine. How how you treat it? Here we go. We get the answer. Lapidus, yeah, has a lapidus. Yeah, do you want to do um, fusion right away? Fusion to maintain medial arch. Reduction bridge blade. Dr. Mitwelli, that's fantastic. So this is what I did, like Dr. Mitwelli. Um, so uh, again, principles of, of fracture, interarticular reduction and fixation, maintain it. We talk to the family saying there is a, a very high risk of arthritis that happens. Although there is a, a Toronto working on a study uh, looking at the long-term outcomes, 
They found that although the X-ray you see arthritis, but usually they're fine and they don't need surgery. So it's a, it's a radiologic finding overall. So I mentioned to the family, very nice family. They understand. So I did the intraarticular reduction and I did the bridging plate. Uh, just consider removal of the bridging plate um, just to restore some mobility if you can. And um, and also I fixed uh, the Les Frank uh, screw. Uh, so this is a bridging plate from the first metatarsal to the navicular. And um, and then I have removed it uh, after uh, about a year. I was planning to remove it in, uh, <clears throat> in about uh, six months, but... Um, uh, I was waiting for uh, further uh, healing and weight bearing. She's doing very well. Uh, this Frank in children is very rare, uh, but when we get it uh, right uh, recently, uh, if it's isolated, this Frank, not um, uh, medial, uh, not not the bony one, we uh, I use a uh, mini tight rope now and it's flexible and it's very good for them especially for the athletes and that's uh, it's an excellent technique it's similar to the tight rope we use for the syndesmosis calcaneo uh, cuboid um <clears throat> All right. Any question about the Les Frank one? No, oh, everyone likes the trauma, though it's a, it's a very rare. I do like two Les Frank a year in children, not like adults. Uh, so this case is 16 year old uh, female and uh, presented with this uh, deformity. Uh, what would be the deformity and uh, what would be your um, differential diagnosis for the pathology? Dr. Hagar is saying uh, Charcot Maritos disease, sir. Perfect. So, Dr. Ali, equino uh, verse, perfect. So, uh, it's it's interesting. See, she presented with uh, equino cavus, uh, but no heel verse. But uh, yeah, mostly the presenters equino cavus, uh, base cavus, excellent. So, uh, it's uh, severe base cavus. And uh, Dr. Hager mentioned it's Charcot Maritus. Uh, she's actually had Charcot Maritus, but. Um, um, I usually send them to, we have uh, two amazing uh, pediatric neuromuscular. Uh, one of them is, uh, is PhD on muscular conditions. And one, the other one is subspecialized in neuro, preferred neuropathy. I haven't seen people like them. They're fantastic. Uh, they make my life easy. They do the EMGs in children, the nerve conduction, uh, they have a lot of um, genetic testing. And uh, before I used to do the assessment myself and uh, get the sensation, but uh, it's better to be documented by them. And uh, and she had a family history of CVT, uh, CMT, uh, Charcot Marie Tooth. And uh, with the Charcot Marie Tooth, um, they get uh, progressive uh, preferred neuropathy. And there was a progressive Preferred neuropathy is get muscle imbalance, weak tip anterior. Uh, usually, tip posterior is overworking. Brunei's longus uh, is uh, also uh, stronger than the Brunei's previous. That's another uh, a common question in the doctora. They, they like it, uh, Brunei's longus, because the Brunei's longus is uh, inserted in the first metatarsal, so it causes uh, plantar flexion of the first metatarsal that uh, exaggerated the cavus. Um, a deformity and um, although when I say tip end is weak and the planters are stronger uh, it doesn't mean you don't examine it always examine it and make sure which uh, tendon and group of tendons is stronger and, and which one is weaker 
make sure when you examine to document the, the strength, the, the degree of strength, uh, is it uh, four out of five, five out of five, three out of five, and uh, it's very important for your management. And um, uh, usually this patient, when they come to you, they're symptomatic. They have pain, they have callus, uh, they're not able to wear their shoes. Um, uh, because of weak dorsiflexors, they're not able to walk uh, properly. Uh, I always examine their spine and examine their hips. Uh, so 10 to 15% can get uh, a secondary hip dysplasia. Um, so uh, she tried orthotics, she tried everything, and uh, she still continued to have pain and difficulty standing. She works as a cashier. Uh, so what will be your next management plan? Of tissue reconstruction. Tissue reconstruction. Cam Walker first uh, or contact cast. I tried Dr. Ali, but uh, it's failed. So she's looking for surgery now. Just uh, for Dr. Hager, uh, would uh, soft tissue reconstruction be sufficient in these cases? Yeah, it's a difficult because the underlying pathology is progressing, and uh, but uh, uh, soft tissue reconstruction. Um, uh, you mean soft tissue release only of the uh, plantar fascia and uh, plantar uh, muscle groups, plus or minus tendo Achilles dentinning. <laughs> Charcot joint, absolute disease, perineus longus to brevis transfer, lengthening of gastric to the Achilles, Achilles lengthening, plantar fascia release, first metastasis osteotomy, dorsal closing osteotomy, dwire, uh, dwire if needed, and uh, tip post transfer. Uh, this is what I like to start, Dr. Marv. Uh, I like to start with this technique and the hind foot. So I like to start with uh, I would I would classify the, the management uh, to three things: uh, soft tissue release, uh, tendon transfer, and osteotomies. The bony uh, osteotomies, um, and um, and if the hind foot is fixed um, and is inverse, so we can do the dewire or the uh, um, calcaneal slide. Uh, but I usually start with medial plantar release. Uh, so I release the plantar fascia, I release the abductor tendon, uh, intramuscular lengthening of the tendon, and um, I release as much as I can from the short planters uh, from the calcaneus uh, insertion. And uh, again, uh, always remember the key on any pediatric foot deformity is the tail on a so in this case, I don't have any x-rays, but the navicular, the talus was pointing dorsal and the navicular was pointing uh, plantar. Uh, so try to um, to release the capsule, uh, medial plantar. Dr. Hamdi used to call this extensive soft tissue release. Um, so he releases the capsule of the talus navicular, releases the capsule of the navicular medial cuneiform and get this up. Uh, I like to do uh, uh, open wedge plantar for the medial cuneiform, uh, although this is a severe deformity. I was surprised after soft tissue release how I was able to get telonavicular coverage. The foot was more straight, and I fixed temporary with K-wires. Did open wedge osteotomy plantar uh, from the medial cuneiform, which is not easy because it's very plantar and deep. Uh, I like the new plate now. It's a lengthening plate, uh, so it has it's like podo plate for the tibia. So we bought the lengthened plate with different size and um, you insert it 
I like the distractors. I have the cannulated distractors with guide wires and put the, the slide, the cannulated distractor on them, open it, slide the plate, fix it with lock and screws. And uh, I'm a big fan of TBL's posterior tendon transfer. It's amazing. It improves the function significantly. And um, perineus longus to brevis transfer, which is uh, one of the easiest transfers. Uh, so you open on the perineal tendons and transfer um, the uh, longus uh, to brevis. Uh, has two benefits. The longus alleviates the plantar flexion of the first ray and also strengthens the uh, brevis. Um, uh, before the tendon transfer, make sure the Achilles tendon is not tight and doesn't need lengthening. Uh, most of the time, I prefer the uh, gastric recession uh, more than tendon Achilles lengthening. They're already weak. I don't want to weaken them, them more unless it's super uh, tight and equinus. But make sure you hind the midfoot for foot when you assess for dorsiflexion because uh, don't get confused by plantar flexion from the midfoot. Uh, that looks like severe equinus, while the ankle joint is not. So it's um, uh, it's very important. And uh, even Dr. Herzenberg in Baltimore uh, suggests doing uh, assessment of dorsiflexion uh, of the ankle joint by uh, X-ray uh, to make sure that the tibiocalcaneal angle is normal uh, before you do Achilles tendon, unnecessary over lengthening of the Achilles ten tendon lengthening. Um, tib post transfer as long as to brevis transfer. Then I assess the toes after uh, if they get uh, clawing of the toes. For the lesser toes, I do flexor tonotomies. For the big toe, I do uh, modified joints technique. And modified joints is another tendon transfer. You get the extensor halluses, each L transfer to the neck of the first of the tarsal. And the uh, modification of joints was fusion of the IP joint. Uh, still, uh, evidence, there is no strong evidence uh, between comparing early fusion and sharp with meritos versus reconstruction. So I'm taking the advantage to start with reconstruction first before the fusion. As a main principle we, we talk about in children, we, we try to delay the fusion and always have a reserve for the next surgery if they need it. Uh, most of them are doing fine. And even with CMT, and it's a big uh, difference in standard of care between Europe and North America and Europe. Uh, they believe on fusion, primary fusion, and uh, some people even do primary fusion plus uh, tip post transfer. Um, I'm I'm still believe in reconstruction, maintaining mobility if I can. The only one I did primary fusion for him came with a severe rigid deformity. And his mom told me I did every single surgery uh, possible to my feet because she had Charcot Marie tooth. And the only surgery worked for me it was a fusion. And I said, you know what? I feel like he needs fusion. Nothing would work for him. He's rigid. And uh, what you're saying makes me more comfortable taking this decision right away. Uh, he had bilateral uh, uh, triple fusion and he's, uh, he's, he's doing very well and he's very happy. Perfect. Don't uh, don't forget uh, the hips in these cases. Ten to fifteen percent get secondary hip dysplasia, and um, they might need hip reconstruction. Uh, lots of debate about the hips. It's good to mention this now. I know we're talking about feet, but um, um, there's a debate if they need varus osteotomy or not. Uh, they have proximal muscle weakness, and they have a significant abductor weakness with CMT. Uh, so virus will make it worse. Uh, so try to avoid virus osteotomy and, and CMT as you get deterioration of the function. Any questions? Yes. Perfect. Oh, <laughs> thank you. That's good. Um, that's a quick case, uh, eight months old. Uh, what's the diagnosis?
looks scary, but it's it's easy. Like in adults, you see a lot of hallux valgus, but in the children can get congenital hallux verse. Excellent. And um, like the message with the hallux verse, uh, although this one has uh, a, a polydactyly and, and that makes it more easy for the diagnosis, but um, um, just a message, I usually order ultrasound, make sure that there is no uh, brachymetatarsalgia and um, and it's a piece of cartilage that causes uh, uh, tensioning uh, on the metaphysis of the first metatarsal. Excellent. Uh, bracket physis, Dr. Mitwelli. And um, and uh, make sure when you do the correction uh, to excise it. Um, so just excise whatever cartilage here because this is the reason of recurrence. Polydactyly excise it. And um, and if it's severe deformity, I do Z uh, incision, and then I can do Z lengthening of the skin. Um, to, to you do uh, medial capsular release, any any tights of tissue here, you release it, reduce it back. <laughs> Doctor Mosca doesn't pin it. I pin it <laughs> because I feel more secure. But that's all about the preferred circulation. Put them in a cast for three weeks. And then uh, uh, things will be all right, especially if you remove the bracket cartilage. Sir, you do only only release from one side or release and plication in the same time in the same time. Uh, yeah, I, I do release and plication at the same time. Yeah. And plication is just one stitch <laughs> on the on the lateral aspect. And, uh, I, I'm I'm a believer of the minimum, uh, so not not to do big dissections and. Uh, and avoiding bigger scars in the future. It's a nice case, sir. Yeah, and keep following them until they're, they're done growing. It's interesting, sometimes they, uh, they present to plastics, not to me. So I have the club foot clinic. Sometimes they get referred to the plastic surgeon, uh, but um, he calls me if, if, if he gets a similar case. Uh, and I take advantage. I say, you know what? I love your incisions. I, I love your sutures. So uh, you start incisions, and I will deal with the bone, and then uh, I let them close. Uh, they're always they're always better than me. Oh, I'm going backward, I think. Uh, so that was a quick one. Um, so back to the flat foot. So this patient is um, eleven year uh, boy uh, with rigid flat foot and it's painful. Uh, what would be your diagnosis? So tarsal coalition, Dr. Ali, and what type of tarsal coalition? CN coalition, excellent, Dr. Mitwali. So CN is calcineo navicular coalition. Uh, I like the I like the when you say CN because uh, it's uh, the famous tower of Toronto. It's called CN Tower, so it's easy when we teach. I see the CN coalition, so residents can remember. So I I love it. And um, and is there any signs an um, anteater sign? Perfect. And the nose, C and coalition, the Murf. A very uh, excellent uh, group today. So, if you notice here, there is an anti eater nose sign. And um, and if you look at the oblique view, um, the calcaneus is so close to um, the navicular. And um, you can still see a, a little bit of gap. So, people would consider this as a cartilaginous coalition. I usually recommend doing get a CT scan. A lot some argument about CT versus MRI. MRI is in the foot is uh, no, I don't have axial for Dr. Mitwali, but um, uh, we added to the protocol now. These are cases when I came here. Um, I do right now we do axial views and we do also the uh, Salzman uh, view to look at the. Uh, at uh, heel alignment. Um, but anyways, when I see tarsal coalition, I order bilateral uh, CT feet. Uh, so that's my standard. Um, 
it doesn't it, it didn't show that it was a significant radiation it's far away from the central organs and uh, it is the best uh, view for me to look at the coalition we know that um, we expect more coalition at the same foot or bilateral is about 50 percent and most of these cases are surgical i know we all like surgery um, so it's better not to do surgery on the flexible painless flat feet but if you would like to do surgery, this is the one that would need surgery. Uh, and uh, make sure of two things, or maybe this will be the next question. Uh, what would be the most important uh, for you before you decide to do uh, just excision, number one. Second option, excision reconstruction. Number three, fusion. Uh, how you decide uh, to do excision versus excision reconstruction uh, versus ex uh, versus fusion. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Magnitude of deformity, excellent. So some people say, yeah, subtilar joint status. Um, a more explanation, Dr. Ali? Oh. The subtalar joint. Magnitude of coalition, the size of coalition. That's that's excellent. Yeah, sure. We don't want to get too much. Okay. No arthritis. Excellent. No arthrosis. So if there's arthritis, it makes sense. Fusion would be the best treatment already, uh, arthritis. Um, but most of them don't present with arthritis early. It's also got to differentiate. This type is CN coalition. Usually, uh, if it's severe, they come with heel valgus and severe flat foot. And I will tell you from my experience, um, I was excited sometimes to correct the deformity at the same time. Uh, so what I used to get is excise the coalition. And I say, wow, that's a good bone. Uh, let's use it as a bone graft to lengthen the calcaneus. So use the bone graft to, for calcaneus lengthening and deal with the, um, with the flat foot, as we mentioned in the first case. Uh, but there's a lot of see in coalition or TC only. Yes, we'll talk about this at good point, Dr. Mutuali. But I'll focus on this. Uh, and uh, and I'll tell you, don't do excision of CN and reconstruction at the same time. Right. Why? The problem is the already stiff and rigid. And they feel better if we do excision and send them for intensive physiotherapy, restore the mobility, even with with uh, with the deformity if they have a heel valgus or severe flat foot. But mobility is very essential to them. And uh, and then later on, you can do the reconstruction. And I would advise in these cases, if you do reconstruction and you have the chance of doing minimal invasive surgery, is to do it with a minimal invasive uh, protocol uh, so they can start mobility early. Uh, but the question, Dr. Metwali, is, there is a difference between the CN coalition and the telocalcaneal coalition. When when we have the telocalcaneal coalition, these are the cases that uh, can get oversized and they can get <coughs> arthritis. And these are the cases that's debatable versus fusion versus uh, surgery. The first study came with uh, indication for fusion when they say, uh, if the coalition is more than 50% of the subtalar joint. And um, until now, people have a hard time uh, understanding 50% to what uh, from the first paper. So we look at, keep looking at the reading to be what he means by 50%. And so we do axial CT cut, and usually it's in the middle facet, and uh, we compare it to uh, the subtalar joint, the posterior subtalar joint. So it's, a, it's kind of confusing. Then uh, when I do some cases, it's not only uh, the depth 
uh, it's also some, I get some cases, the coalition is super long, like it's taken all the facets, uh, even to anterior. So that's another factor. So it's not only the depth, uh, you, co you compare the depth, the transverse width to the transverse width of the subtalar joint of the axial view, but why we don't consider the length as well. Or we think, why we don't consider the volume? Well, let's get the whole volume, length and width, compared to the volume of the subtalar joint. Um, but if it's less than 50% with whatever thing, it's more academic discussion uh, than I do excision. Uh, it's not easy to do the telo calcaneal coalition excision. And um, you have all the tendons, all the neurovascular around you. So I have to make sure everything is very protected. I had a case, um, I used a bear to start with, was a very long one. And at the end, I found him had, um, I cut his um, helixer digitorum with the bear, although I did everything possible to protect it. And I had to repair it. Then uh, I want to start mobility and you're stuck now. We want to uh, splint him until he his tendon gets repaired. So it's a very bad complication and made me very, very upset. Uh, that day, he's doing fine now. He restored the mobility at the same time. He restored um, the function of the FDL. Uh, but just be very careful with uh, when you cut um, Telo calcaneal uh, coalition. Uh, we're doing a big study now in North America about uh, recurrence rate of telonavicular Telo calcaneal coalition and and what are the factors for revision. Uh, we'll let you know about the outcomes in, in the future once it's uh, finished. Um, radiographic science, we went through it. Further test, we said, I, I prefer the CT. Some people do MRI. I um, I like the CT better. And here's the CT, and you can see it. Radiology, we'll call it cartilaginous uh, coalition. And... Um, indication of arthrodesis, we said severe deformity and arthritis. And um, I just did excision, send them to start mobility right away. Uh, this is the best course of treatment. You make a cast after coalition resection only. Uh, I actually bought them in a slab uh, for a week or two. What you prefer. Uh, do you use fat or ten? Excellent. Uh, I just, uh, so I, I tried everything and I stopped doing the tendon or the FDB uh, um, and um, I use the bone wax. And when you use the bone wax, just, just a flick uh, at the edge, just a tiny bit. And anything loose, take it out. Uh, so I like the bone wax now, the thinnest uh, cover to the edges. And uh, everything is working so far so good. Uh, I tried um, uh, fat before. Um, I didn't like it and it gets infection and, and it's, it's hard to maintain it. It's like uh, pops out <laughs> easily. And, um, and the bone wax so far, a thin layer covers the edges of the bone and it's, it's excellent. Uh, when you cut, make sure don't cut the, uh, so the, the head uh, of the talus is close to you. So both guide wires uh, uh, to mark the levels and uh, uh, make sure when you uh, when you go inside, go straight with the osteoto osteotomes. Um, uh, and um, yeah, there's a question about arthroscopy. Um, uh, there is a paper done about arthroscopic uh, excision. Uh, I don't think it's worth to, to do it. Like, I love the ankle scopes, subterra scopes, but I don't think it's worth to to do it. It's a small incision, anyways. And um, oh, Mark with guide wires, uh, don't take too much, but at, at the same time, make a space distance for uh, about one centimeter. This might decrease the risk of recurrence, but uh, we don't have the outcomes yet for the study. Uh, but we'll see what what are the factors for the revision cases. And make sure you remove all the coalition. I do. Uh, I go with uh, peanuts uh, all around it. it. You'll be lucky if you're able to go uh, around it deeply, so you can know before you cut 
how deep you need to get the bar excision. And this is one of my favorite surgery is the bar excision of the CN. Uh, one of the surgery that makes me very nervous is the bar excision of the uh, telocalcanium. Do you use osteotome? I use the osteotome for um, uh, the uh, CN. Or you bear, you bear down to plantar extent. I don't use bear for CN, but I use bear for the telocalcanium. And um, uh, last thing uh, for the uh, radiographic signs, you know, people always talk about the C sign uh, for the calcaneal, for the telocalcaneal. And uh, Scott Mubarak published uh, about the C sign. It's, uh, it's a very good study. He said it's uh, positive in uh, 60%. So don't use the C sign as a positive thing, uh, 100%. So it's 60%. And it has to be continuous C sign, not interrupted. So you see here, here's interruption here. That means there's no coalition at the tail of But it has to be uh, a complete C sign. I wish I have a, a X-ray to show you. Complete one. Excellent, Dr. Vittorio. Any questions? Um, I know it's uh, uh, if 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 you want me to stop or if you want me to have a break, I think we do have nine cases today. Uh, we can always do it in, in another time. Alhamdulillah, the the Continue. Okay. <laughs> uh, we're getting there. Two more cases. Please continue, Dr. Harder. Um, so case number eight. This is a 17-year-old male. Uh, has trisomy 21. Uh, uh, came. His mom said he has a significant foot pain. He, to the point like he can't walk more than 10 steps now. Um, so can you describe the x-ray? Uh, oh, sorry. Well, sorry, Dr. Mitwali, I have only these AP and lateral and and valgus foot, perfect. So, um, any more details? Four foot abduction, Taylor uncovered flat arch, perfect. And can you can you see where is the tail as compared to the calcaneus? Severe pronation. Although, like the word pronation, I have to be very careful with in, in flat foot because uh, I would agree pronation happens uh, in the hind foot, but the forefoot usually have compensatory supination. But um, yeah, severe flat foot, uh, almost closed sinus, yeah. And you see the level of the talus? It's at the level of the calcaneus. They're like beside each other. Like usually the talus is uh, on top of the calcaneus. This is what uh, we have learned in the medical school, but uh, with this one, is, uh, it's everted. So yeah, he has a severe deformity. And when, when, you, when you see these severe cases, first thing to jump in your mind is uh, connective tissue disorder. Um, we know that he's uh, uh, down... Uh, syndrome and with uh, trisomy 21, it's one of the connective tissue disorder. As uh, other cases that can have connective tissue disorders can be Marfan syndrome, uh, can be um, the L.R. Danlos syndromes, and um, uh, Ostrogen imperfecta can get uh, this. And uh, 
It's one of the poor uh, syndromes that's been studied, and uh, we had a, an excellent team worked on publishing on uh, connective tissue disorders uh, with uh, hip dysplasia. Uh, they behave differently than any other idiopathic cases. And also, uh, uh, we were lucky last year with an uh, uh, excellent team. Dr. Karim Gaber and his team published on uh, uh, our thoughts about connective tissue disorders, uh, foot uh, problems, yeah, subtalar eversion, and, uh, and was published in uh, GBGS uh, reviews this year. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> What do you do for this patient? Soft tissue release needs bony reconstruction, calcul and lengthening osteotomy with or without kiniform osteotomy. If painful, triple fusion. So, uh, if painful, triple fusion. Perfect. Uh, so, although I, I mentioned before, I'm a big fan of reconstruction. But um, the connective tissue disorders are showing a huge, a significant recurrence. It doesn't work. It doesn't apply to them. And because you cannot tension the soft tissues, even the tendon transfer doesn't work as normal. Uh, the very uh, hypermobile, very low suffusion would be the answer. So excellent uh, to the point that uh, people who mentioned the fusion. Uh, Preoperative consideration, uh, always remember these cases get neck instability. You don't want them to die under uh, anesthesia with intubation, so get flexion extension, uh, C-spine. You order it. It's your responsibility as a surgeon. And um, here's the x-rays after reconstruction. I had a very hard time to get the talus on top of the calcaneus at the subtalar joint. So it was inverted, as Dr. Mitwelli mentioned. And uh, then I have to do distractor. Uh, so I put the distractor one pin and the calcaneus one pin on the lateral uh, malleolus. And so with the distraction, uh, I corrected the uh, talo calcaneal uh, height to get it above. It was a hard time to find the subtalar joint. Uh, so we did the subtalar uh, arthrodesis, denusion of the cartilage, make sure you get the bleeding bone so you can get a good fusion. Make sure you do compression with the screws. These are headless screws. It's called Fexos by uh, Stryker. And, um, and you get the TLO uh, navicular, same thing. Open the TLO navicular joint, denusion of the cartilage. Use a bear, use a small bear, use a new uh, Shannon bear for the minimal, minimal invasive. And uh, I like to fix it with a, a plate and also a screws for compression. And uh, plus or minus calcineocreoboid. Uh, I like the double fusion. Um, I don't see a big difference unless uh, still there is a lateral uh, lateral column deformity. Then I do calcineocreoboid fusion. Approach: uh, it's, uh, I did uh, the uh, lateral approach for the subtalar and medial approach for um, the telonavicular. He did very well. He has a hip retroversion, so he still walks with out towing, but he was out towing 90 degrees. Now he's out towing 30 degrees. Mom was asking, I said, I don't think um, I should do the femur osteotomy. Uh, he's happy this way. He starts to walk again. He's back to his function. Um, he passed the 18. She wants me to do the second side, uh, but I sent him to uh, adult foot and ankle surgeon because uh, we're not allowed to do surgery above the age of 18. Uh, do you use a do you use graft? Yes, I I like to use um, uh, master graft. It's a synthetic bone graft. There's a lot of debate. Uh, if I have uh, impingement, uh, post traumatic impingement, I use um, uh, 
uh, allograft. Uh, but uh, in his case, because I was able to get a good compression, uh, I augmented with uh, master grafts, which is like of, uh, of capsules of of bone graft. It's calcium phosphate. Any other questions? Perfect. We start to lose people. People falling asleep. It's uh, twenty four now. Uh, we started with 30, so we lost six people, uh, but uh, thanks for the 24 who are staying. Uh, last case. Um, so this one, I just saw him in the clinic today, and uh, we did his surgery two weeks ago. So uh, it's a good case. So this patient uh, was wrestling and uh, with his friend, and he got uh, a proximal tibia fracture while wrestling. And they had a common perineal nerve injury. Unfortunately, it was a super nice kid, super active, and uh, and uh, you know, common perineal nerve doesn't do well. And uh, even plastics did their best. I prefer nerve uh, surgeons. Uh, they did their best, and then they referred to me to deal with his uh, foot drop. So he has a foot drop, and uh, he's not able. Has zero dorsiflexion. And uh, over time, he uh, develops a heel virus as well. Uh, so what would be your um, uh, your treatment? TBL specific transfer. TBL specific transfer. That's excellent. So uh, it's a, this is the best uh, surgical option. Uh, but uh, Dr. Ali mentioned that uh, orthosis. So AFO can replace uh, TBL posterior tendon transfer. But um, with this kind of person who's super active playing hockey, uh, he he hates it. Uh, so we bought him an AFO. He has a good function. He's able to walk better now. Uh, was uh, push off, uh, but uh, he keeps coming asking for surgery. So yeah, usually the surgery is TBL is posterior transfer. It is the best option for uh, for uh, foot drop. I don't know what's a bridal uh, uh, procedure. Dr. Marif and Dr. Abdullah. EMG, yes, he he's doing this, uh, Dr. Ali, with uh, preferred neurology, uh, preferred uh, uh, neurosurgeons, and um, and uh, it's uh, it's not working. He has zero function of common perineal nerve. What's a bridal procedure, guys? I I don't know what is this. The post uh, transfer to lateral kiniform. Excellent. He's not happy with the AFO, Dr. Mitwalli. He's, he's very active, and uh, I tried to convince him to stay with the AFO. He's, no, he wants to be active. Perfect. So we all agree about the post transfer, and uh, that's my top favorite surgery, the tip post transfer. Why? Because it achieves excellent function. It's a good thing about him when I examined his dorsiflexion, he has a good amount of dorsiflexion. So make sure first the patient has good amount of dorsiflexion. Otherwise, don't do transfer before you get the achieved dorsiflexion, um, at least 10 degrees of dorsiflexion so you can get a good function. Um, tip post transfer requires four incisions. Uh, first incision, at uh, the insertion. Uh, usually it's inserted uh, mainly at the navicular, but it has seven insertions. Uh, so the most tendinous functional part at the navicular, but one of the issues is you don't want to get a short uh, tendon when you transfer. You do everything and, and you mark the lateral cuneiform and oh my God, it's not reaching. What can I do now? Uh, so to avoid this, I after you you 
you see the insertion at the navicular, you see a little bit of extension going to the medial cuneiform. Take it. It's not very strong functional, but it gives you length better than short. Uh, and then with the osteotome, I cut uh, uh, just a little bit of piece of the uh, navicular, just shave it, uh, but maintaining the same width of the tendon, um, because this is the width that you need to make a hole when you transfer it. Um, Gradle tip was to dorsum, uh, but also connecting tip and okay, and Brunius longest to uh, tip post. Yeah, so one of uh, my fellow uh, mentioned this to me, but I've never seen it. Uh, in long term, does the tip post transfer affect the foot function, like tip post tendon insufficiency in adults? No, it doesn't. It's it's fantastic surgery, Doctor Mitwali, for the function, and that's a very good question. We can. We can talk about this point after um, I, I finish the, the technique uh, I like to do. So first, we make sure the Achilles tendon is good. We have a dorsiflexion at least 10 degrees. Uh, the deformity has a virus deformity I discussed with him. Uh, good news for us. We get the instruments for the minimal invasive. Finally, uh, there is a family from the Clubfoot Clinic donated $25,000 to uh, us. So we bought uh, minimal, minimal invasive instruments that was my first case to do uh, minimal invasive uh, calcaneal uh, slide osteotomy. Uh, so that's fantastic. It's very good, small incision. And do the slide, fix it. So I adjusted the, the heel. And uh, also uh, back to the tip post transfer, like the four incisions, uh, make sure you get length of the tendon, make sure it's circular. Uh, and then another incision just above the median malleolus, uh, pull it back, and then we go extra peroosteal uh, trans uh, syndesmotic. So go through the syndesmosis between the tibia and fibula to bring it, deliver it anterior on the lateral aspect. Um, so I'm gonna show you with uh, uh, Ozama. So come to the lateral aspect from here. So it takes the tendon, one incision here and another incision there, then behind the tibia, uh, but not subperoosteal, extra peroosteal, making sure you don't grab the nerve and vessels, go anterior, uh, dorsally, uh, so laterally, sorry, anterolateral, uh, take it out and then mark the lateral cuneiform. Uh, you don't have to go far lateral, um, so just just lateral to the line of the third ray. And, uh, and then uh, open the incision, uh, you'll see the EDB and EDL. Make sure you're not uh, cutting the tendons. Uh, this dissect them, protect them. Uh, I like to use uh, always uh, interference screw. Uh, so uh, from the ACL tray, uh, so we, we put the guide wire <coughs> first and uh, the guide wire has a hole um, and, uh, and we do the reaming based on the size that you had uh, for the tendon. So we ream around it. And then the guide wire is like a needle, has a big hole. Then we, when we put the sutures that attach it to the tendon, take the wire, the wire comes out from the plantar aspect of the foot. Then you get the dorsiflexion, make sure the foot is corrected, you're happy with the position, and then we put the interference screw, uh, same size of the hole uh, to get the tendon in. I had one case that was short, then I added endobotton at, at the end, or some people do. Uh, keep the uh, sutures and make a small incision and tie the endobotton. Uh, sorry, no, without endobotton, just tie it at the plantar fascia. Uh, sometimes I need it, but if I happy, if I'm happy with the interference screw, I will leave it with the interference screw. Uh, in long term, does it no? So what about uh, the complications after tibialis posterior transfer? Uh, if you use endobotton, uh, one of the complications is you have a heel ulcer. Uh, that's why I, I rarely use it. Uh, people use uh, a huge sponge if you need to use it. Uh, but now I'm happy with the interference screw, or maybe you tighten the suture under the plantar fascia. Uh, uh, actually, uh, the least amount of complication you can get with a small incision tip post transfer the best functional outcome that that surgery is amazing 
uh, in CP, in neuromuscular, in Charcot Marie tools, in foot drop traumatic, uh, it's one of the best thing. Uh, it's the most common question, what do you do with uh, uh, full transfer or split transfer? I like the full transfer to get a good function and um, to avoid the overcorrection. And this is what the people concerned about. Don't go far lateral, don't go to cuboid and, and try just to be uh, just a little bit lateral to the third ray, the mid uh, axis of the foot. And here's uh, first our first MIS calcaneal slide. Um, uh, you see the calcaneus went up a little bit. That eventually I brought it down because you don't want to to get the heel up. Uh, but this came down, and this is all through one centimeter incision. Uh, we use the bear to cut it completely, and then we fixed with uh, the screws that's for the heel verse part. These rings are um, are uh, we use a gown. I use a gown as um, elevator to elevate the photon, so that's it has gown. It has rings, so it's not something in the patient. Now uh, I'm done, um, and uh, feel free to uh, to ask questions. And uh, I, I would thank you very much for uh, staying all this uh, uh, time overnight with, uh, with the pouring kind of uh, discussions. Hopefully, I was able to discuss some of the basic principles. Uh, some of these things are my favorite methods based on the experiences as my practice is uh, almost 50% pediatric foot. Uh, the, the rest is 25% scoliosis and 25% of... Uh, um, uh, head preservation surgery. Uh, another good news that we finally published our new technique, McMaster osteotomy, for severe uh, chronic um, uh, skiffy, and um, this will need uh, uh, another day uh, to discuss. But uh, I'm glad that we came out with. It's not a very uh, 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 innovation from scratch, but it's. Uh, kind of combination of multiple techniques to address all the deformities that happened with the chronic uh, skiffy. Um, it's uh, available online on the Head Preservation Journal. Uh, we paid for the open access, uh, but um, uh, if you can't find it, feel free to uh, uh, send me email and I will send it to you. <laughs> ويعني على المعلومات الغزيرة اللي يعني حصلنا على من على حضرتك منها يعني وأنا بشكر حضرتك إن حضرتك بعثت لي البيبر يعني ده 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 شرف طبعاً كتير ده دايماً أول واحد دكتور محمد ربنا يخليك فن وطبعاً كل الزملاء الأعزاء بيشكروا حضرتك أنا شايف ال يعني الشكر الجزيل يعني زي ما الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم قال من صنع لكم معروفاً فكافئوه فإن لم تستطيعوا فقولوا له جزاكم الله خيراً فإحنا بنقول حضرتك جزاكم الله خيراً يا دكتور وليد يعني ربنا يجزيك خير ويجعله في ميزان حسناتك نشر العلم لأن ده يعني يعادل الدنيا وما فيه وجزاكم مثله وأتمنى أن احنا نكون قدمنا حاجة مفيدة للجميع وإن شاء الله نبقى دائما على خير بإذن الله ربنا يبارك في حضرتك دكتور وليد سعداء يعني والله بالوقت اللي قضناه مع حضرتك ده جدا وأنا شايف أن حضرتك لسه في الشغل وأن احنا خدنا وقت حضرتك من الشغل We are very sorry sir لا لا always always my pleasure to محمد و always my pleasure to اشوف اخواتنا وزمايلنا في الوطن العربي كله ربنا يخلي حضرتك فندم انا طبعا في في نهايه اليوم الجميل ده بنشكر شكر جزيل اخونا العزيز دكتور وليد دي قشطه بروفيسور اند هيد اوف اورثوبيديك ديبارتمنت ماك ماستر يونيفرستي على وقته السمين والكيس برزنتيشن الاكثر من رائعه اللي قضاها معانا وان شاء الله هنشوف حضراتكم يوم الجمعه الجايه مع دكتور محمد هاشم كونسلتنت في اورثوبيدك سيرجري في انجلترا هيتكلم برضو على الهيب ارثروبلاستي ان شاء الله فيعني طبعا احنا يعني سعداء بان احنا بنجمع يعني اخواتنا ويعني واساتذتنا تحت سقف واحد وتحت يعني منصه واحده اللي ربنا سبحانه وتعالى يسر لنا ان احنا يعني نعملها الحمد لله فمتشكرين جدا دكتور وليد ووقت حضرتك السمين شاكرين افضل حضرتك يا فندم ألف ألف شكرا لك محمد شكرا يا فندم شكرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الله يبارك فيك بحفظ الله يا فندم ربنا يراعيك ويحفظك إن شاء الله مع ألف سلامة مع ألف سلامة